Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Pine Ridge Baptist Church Sunday School Hour. It is Sunday, March 28th, 2021. And we've got great news uh, here at Pine Ridge. After a year of being away uh, for many of our services, though we've been able to, to have online services, and we're grateful for that, uh, the uh, recorded Sunday school uh, lesson each Sunday uh, we have not missed. And also for some time now, we've had our morning worship uh, live stream. But come uh, Easter Sunday, uh, next week, Sunday coming up, we will be back to a full schedule of worship services at Pine Ridge Baptist Church. Now, let me remind everyone that uh, is that is our uh, custom at Pine Ridge. There will be no evening service on Easter Sunday, but uh, everything uh, following, uh, beginning with uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting and going forward after that, uh, we will have uh, all services, and we're so grateful uh, to be able to do that. We encourage everyone uh, to join us for those services, if you feel comfortable doing so. We will still uh, practice uh, common sense uh, objectives here with, uh, with our services. Uh, you're welcome to join us uh, if you feel comfortable. If not, we will certainly continue to live stream our Sunday morning services uh, for you. And uh, we're just so grateful that uh, we're going to be able to do that. Also, uh, Children's Church will be available for those uh, families who are coming with uh, uh, young children or grandchildren, and the Children's Church will be through the entire uh, morning worship service. So uh, you'll uh, come, and there will be a, a temperature check uh, for those uh, little ones, and they'll be received into the area where they will have uh, Children's Church during the same time that we're having the morning worship uh, service. So we're excited about that, and we hope you are too. It's, it's been a long time coming, but God's been good to us, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to celebrating uh, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ while also reopening, if you will, Pine Ridge Baptist Church. So please join us. Um, we have many of our people who are sick, uh, who are fighting uh, uh, difficulties, experiencing uh, hardship, and uh, we want to remember them before we get into the lesson this morning. Uh, many of them uh, uh, have tests uh, upcoming this week. Uh, some are recovering from surgeries. Others are, are involved in treatments or will be beginning treatments. Uh, uh, some are bereaved uh, today uh, as we uh, remember them in prayer. And uh, if you would uh, join me now as we pray for these. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you give us uh, to come before you and to bring every need that we have. Bible tells us that you know them already, but it delights your heart uh, when your children bring these needs to you, both uh, on behalf of themselves and certainly on behalf of others, Father. And Lord, in our church here, in our church family, in our extended family, and those that we know that are connected to uh, our church family, Father, Lord, there are many needs. And Father, each one is precious and important to you, Father. And Lord, we bring them to you and ask, Lord, that you would uh, touch each person in a very personal and specific way. Father, we pray that you would lift them up, that you would minister to them, Father, and Lord, that you would draw them closer to you during uh, whatever's going on. Father, bless them and love on them, Father, and Lord, help them feel your very presence. Father, we're reminded, too, that uh, we need to pray for our country, Father, and we do that. Father, we pray for these United States of America, Father, and Lord, I pray that you would uh, guide and direct us, Father, and that you would lead us, Father, and that we would be 
receptive to that, Father. And Lord, that our leaders would seek out your wisdom in all decisions, Father, that are made. Lord, we love this country. We love the freedoms that we enjoy, Father, because people, our ancestors, followed you, Father, and Lord, have followed you. But we've strayed, Father, and Lord, forgive us for that. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you, Father, that we enter into uh, the week leading up to the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Father. Easter Sunday. Resurrection Sunday is coming, Father, and Lord, we celebrate that. That is the very crux, Father, of our faith and our hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Minister to us now, Father, Lord, as we study the lesson, Lord, that you have brought for us, Father. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you. Uh, this lesson is... Uh, the fourth in a series of seven that deal with the essentials of Christianity. Uh, that word essential uh, kind of bears out what uh, the book definition is, but essentials really are must-haves. They're absolutely necessary. They're indispensable for uh, being able to understand something, to do something, or to become something. They're basic, and they're truths. And this morning, we continue uh, to look at those. Uh, as an example, many, many years ago now, uh, I wanted to be a baseball player and played uh, sports all through my uh, youth and growing up years. Uh, never certainly was good enough to play at the professional level. But in order to be a good, effective baseball player, uh, there are several essentials or basics that that person must be able to do. They must be able to throw a ball. They must be able to catch a ball. They must be able to hit a baseball. And they must be able to run. These things seem simple, and they are. They're basic, but they're essential to being able to become a good baseball player and one who would uh, hope to play professionally one day. The same holds true for our faith in Jesus Christ, which is called Christianity. Christian simply put, is defined as a true believer and follower of Jesus Christ. Many folks uh, claim the label Christian, but unless it meets this test, this basic essential definition, then you have to question whether the label is appropriate. People the lost, and believers alike, we're good at misunderstanding some of the basics or essentials of our faith. In this unit, we are focusing on these seven lessons that deal with essential truths of, of our faith. Already, uh, this uh, quarter, we have had lessons that deal with God's nature, with humanity's purpose, and what sin is. Today, we'll look at the death of Jesus and how appropriate as it is the Sunday before the Resurrection Sunday. This was a week long ago that had so much going on. Jesus came into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, being hailed a hero by many. But by the end of the week, he would be crucified as a thief, or between two thieves, rather, 
as an insurrectionist, as, a, as one who uh, was claimed to be overthrowing the government. Our scripture that we'll look at in a moment comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 19. You may want to turn there with me and follow along as we refer to parts of that in a moment. The focus of, God, of John's gospel was really simple. He wanted to convince people that Jesus was the Messiah that they had heard about and that he was the Savior of the world. Our lesson steps into that dark early morning hours before Jesus' encounter, before Pilate, who was the Roman governor of Judea, and he was situated in Jerusalem. He was the top uh, Roman government official for that area. We'll start there in a moment as we examine the death of Jesus. The lesson uh, today, the point for that lesson is that forgiveness is possible because Jesus died for our sins. You know, as sinners, we all need forgiveness. We need God's forgiveness to be reconciled to Him. Do you ever get frustrated when... Uh, you are not able to fix something. I know I do. I am not very mechanically inclined. I'm better than I used to be. But I, I, I marvel at those folks who have those skills, who can look at something and take tools and, and, and fix it. But we all get frustrated at not being able to fix something. As I mentioned, you may not be mechanically uh, inclined or skilled. You can't analyze your way through a problem. You can't plan a way to a solution. There are no do-it-yourself videos, not even on YouTube, that can help you. You know, and the, the list goes on and on and on. When sin entered into the world of humans in the Garden of Eden through Adam and Eve's choice to disobey. Yes, they made a choice. It created a separation or a divide between humans and God that humans cannot fix, cannot repair, cannot bypass, cannot re-engineer. We don't have the capability to do that, though many seem to try using one method or one form or, or one uh, tactic over the other. That precious and perfect relationship with our Creator was broken. And here's a thought. A broken or where there's a broken relationship, there is no fellowship. That occurred. And remember, before sin came in, God had a perfect relationship and a perfect fellowship with Adam and with Eve, who were the chief part of his enormous creation one that was made in his own image. See, the truth is, we can't fix everything. We can't fix a broken relationship with God. Only one person can fix that relationship. And that sin problem. That person is Jesus Christ. And he had to die be the blood sacrifice to pay 
the extraordinarily severe price and penalty for our sin. As we look at the death of Jesus, let's consider a few important things. No doubt, it was a gruesome, agonizing, and torturous way to die. Arguably, the most severe form of execution known to man. Crucifixion. It was severe and agonizing emotionally and spiritually for Jesus as well. Oftentimes, we, when we look at the crucifixion of Jesus, we focus uh, the lion's share of our attention on the, the horrendous physical nature of it. And it was. And we'll speak more to that uh, a little bit later. But there was a tremendous emotional and spiritual price that Jesus paid to rectify and to eliminate the penalty that God required for sin. His most precious and valued part of creation rejected and rebelled against him. And it created tremendous emotional pain for our Lord and Savior. Plus, the fact that he was covered in and was carrying our sins separated him from God the Father for the very first time in his life. Jesus knew no sin. And he had that perfect relationship and fellowship with his father until he bore all of that, all of your and my sin on the cross of Calvary. And that created spiritual separation that was very painful to him. A third point that we need to remember is the severity of Jesus' death and its requirement for reconciliation to the Father and full payment of the sin debt speaks to how thorough and complete God's hatred and disdain for sin is. Think about that. The severity of His death Physically, emotionally, spiritual separation. A tremendously high price to pay set down alongside God's hatred and disdain for sin. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice that willingly endured and suffered the payment for your and my sin. Only He could do it. We could not. You talk about God's love for His creation. That pretty much describes it. And even with that, we can't understand it to the depth that God gave it. He provided the only way for us to be reconciled to Him. He created us in His image. He loves us more than we can even know. And when we sinned and rebelled and rejected Him and wanted to destroy Him and have nothing to do with Him, He loved us so much that He provided Himself in the form of Jesus Christ, God incarnate in flesh, to pay the penalty so that we still have the opportunity to accept Him as our Lord and Savior. That's a love that we can't express in our humanness and to give. We celebrate the birth of Jesus at Christmas. However, without the death or His death and His resurrection, which we'll see in next week's lesson, we would still have no way back to our Heavenly Father. We would be eternally separated, that is, lost. As the hymn says, Jesus paid it all. 
When Jesus defeated death, it was once and for all, for all of eternity. There are no rematches. Death has been defeated. Because He lives, we can experience eternal life. Let's look at John chapter 19, verses 8 through 11. I'll uh, read those if you want to read along with me. Again, we're stepping into uh, interaction between uh, Pilate, Jesus, and the religious leaders. Uh, it has been a long night for Jesus. And we're in the early morning hours uh, following the Passover supper, the Last Supper, and the time in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed and was ultimately uh, taken into custody. Verse 8 says, When Pilate heard this statement, he was more afraid than ever. He went back into the headquarters and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus did not give him an answer. So Pilate said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus replies, You would have no authority over me at all, Jesus answered him, if it hadn't been given you from above. This is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. As I mentioned, as we, as we step into this situation, we see the exchange between Pilate, Jesus, and later the religious leaders who were clamoring and stirring up the general population for the execution of Jesus. The religious leaders saw him as more than just a political threat. They saw him as a political and a religious threat, and they thought that uh, as people rallied to Jesus, as people uh, began to follow him, that Jesus was going to take their place and take their piece of the action, if you will, uh, as the authorities and those who could uh, use their positions to continue their, the lifestyle of wealth and power that they had uh, come, uh, become accustomed to. Pilate, as I mentioned, was the Roman governor of Judea. Uh, he had a rocky relationship with the Jews. The Jews hated the Romans because of the uh, fact that they oppressed them uh, physically, uh, governmentally, uh, with taxation, they were just uh, onerous toward them. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the Romans hated the Jews and the Jews hated the Romans. So there was a ro rocky relationship there at best. And with the celebration of the Passover in Jerusalem and the, the throngs of people that were gathered in, uh, any turmoil in Jerusalem was not viewed very favorably by those back in Rome. Uh, they would hold Pilate accountable. Uh, they wanted calm. They wanted to make sure that uh, you know, everything was under control. They wanted those tax dollars coming back to uh, Rome uh, to uh, go into the coffers of those in power there. Uh, they wanted stability. And anything less than that uh, would reflect badly on Pilate. And, you know, in worst case scenario, uh, could cost him his life. So he wanted to avoid a riot. And this could explain why, why ultimately he would uh, hand Jesus over to those clamoring for him to be crucified. But uh, uh, Pilate was frightened. He was scared by the Jews and the statement that they gave or the reason they gave for why uh, Jesus should be crucified. 
and that they wanted him released to them. According to the Jews, Jesus had blasphemed by claiming to be God's son. And this statement frightened Pilate. Remember that on, in, in the situation there that only the Roman government could execute a prisoner. The Jews could not do that. That's why the Jews uh, had taken uh, their case to Pilate, uh, asking Pilate as the uh, supreme Roman authority in Jerusalem to give Jesus over to them so that, and to uh, declare that he was guilty of, of the crime and should be uh, crucified as his punishment. The Jews had no authority in this matter, and that's why they made their request. One of the reasons that Pilate was frightened, among others, was that Romans believed that gods, little g, often took human form. The idea of judging someone who claimed to be the son of God could have scared Pilate in his boots. In Matthew 27, 19, you will remember that Pilate's wife even warned Pilate to have nothing to do with Jesus. Pilate was in a dilemma. He was fretting. He was sweating. It was very, very uncomfortable for him. He had to make a decision. He would have loved to, to use a football term, punted the football away to the other team, but that was not an option. He was going to have to either uh, clear Jesus and set him free, or he was going to have to give in to the demands of the religious leaders. Now, earlier, in earlier verses, uh, when Jesus was first brought to Pilate, he had uh, asked him several questions and things, and he had had him flogged and beaten and scourged. And we'll talk a little bit about what that entails in a moment. So he had already uh, punished Jesus, even through uh, the, the initial uh, encounter and interrogation of him. But this was not satisfying the religious leaders. They wanted more. They wanted Jesus, and they wanted him so that they could crucify him to kill him. The dilemma was he didn't think Jesus was guilty, and he said so. He told this to the religious leaders, you know, more than one time. He says, I find no guilt in this man. I've scourged him. I've beaten him. I've had him flogged. But I don't think he's guilty. But on the other hand, you know, he was fearful of, for his position. He liked his position. There were a lot of good things that accrued to him because he was the top Roman official in Jerusalem. He did not want to riot as the Jews could not be appeased with what he was uh, offering them, uh, a lesser punishment of Jesus. I mentioned flogging and scourging. Try to picture this. A man is uh, brought into a public place and he's tied to a post, uh, placed on his knees. His shirt is taken off. And a big, strong, strapling Roman soldier has what looks like a, a whip. And at the end of the whip, it has tails or fingers on it. And in those fingers, they have embedded... Uh, pieces of bone, pieces of rock, and other things. And this big Roman soldier would draw back and with the full force he would deliver uh, a lash, you know, time after time, ever how many uh, they thought that the prisoner uh, needed or should get, you know, 20, 30, whatever. They didn't want to kill the person 
But every time that cat of nine tails hit the back, the, the, the naked uh, flesh of the, of the prisoner, that, that soldier would pull the whip back as those pieces of bone and fragments of, of rock dug into the flesh and pulled the flesh open. After a while, you can imagine what the back of Jesus looked like. Like raw hamburger with blood and things oozing out. This did not satisfy the religious leaders. So now, Pilate was more scared than ever before. Wringing his hands, searching for a way to move forward from the situation. So he went back to Jesus and asked, Where are you from? Jesus didn't answer him. He was silent. Much of what Jesus did in this week and in this situation was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah and in Psalms. Long before Jesus was born, it spoke about how he would be taken and how he would react during this week where he would ultimately be crucified. Pilate expected an answer from him. Why? Because Pilate was the boss, or he thought he was the boss. He had the authority. He was the top official in Jerusalem. Even the Jews knew that everything went through Pilate. But what Jesus did in not responding fulfilled the prophecy in Isaiah 53. In verse 10, Pilate was frustrated because Jesus wouldn't respond to him. So he, rather than, than you know, uh, play along any longer, he cut right to the chase. He played his ace card, if you will. As the top Roman official in Jerusalem, Pilate wanted to remind Jesus that he was in charge. So Pilate asserted that he had the final word on Jesus' fate. He told him, he says, I can release you or I can remand you over to the Jews to be crucified. Jesus didn't answer the question, where are you from? Maybe he thought that uh, Pilate wouldn't understand. But he did respond to the threat that Pilate issued in verse 11. After offering no response on where he was from, his origin, Jesus willingly responded to and stressed uh, to the governor that Pilate had no real authority at all. Pilate only exercised the authority that was given to him or granted him by God, the power from above. In other words, Jesus slam dunked. He played the royal flush on Pilate. You know, this is still true today. We live in a world, you know, and we see various leaders and groups that... Uh, have power and authority in governmental and other situations. But their power is only there because it comes from above. We saw this in the book of Job. You know, Satan uh, had to ask permission from God to be able to inflict uh, all of the uh, stress and all of the hurt uh, on Job. Jesus called out Pilate, who had no true authority, and placed himself in the hands of the one who has and holds all the authority, God the Father. See, Jesus understood completely 
the Father's plans for payment of the sin debt. God loves us so much, He does not want us to be separated from Him. It's His will that we be reconciled to Him. It does not please God at all for a single person to die separated from Him, not knowing Him. That gives Him no pleasure whatsoever to say, Depart from me, I never knew you. The idea that some may have that, that that gives God pleasure to do that is not true. It breaks his heart if even one has to be cast off. Jesus knew the plan, and he, that is Jesus, was determined to complete it, no matter how hard it was going to be on him. Jesus the prisoner became the ultimate judge. Jesus declared the Jews who had handed him over to Pilate had the greater sin than the Romans who were just the people who carried out the execution. Caiaphas was the chief priest. He was the high priest. And possibly his co-conspirators on the religious uh, uh, body, if you will, the Sanhedrin, should have recognized Jesus as the Messiah that had been promised. They were the religious leaders and they didn't know this. Instead, Caiaphas and these others abused their power and their position of, and spiritual authority. By sending Jesus to the Romans for execution, Caiaphas and these others incurred a more serious judgment. As Jesus' own words say there in verse 11. The latter part of that says, This is why the one who handed me over to you, speaking to Pilate, has the greater sin. Pilate was afraid. He was mortified. And he is a coward. The Jews exploited his fear and his cowardice and Pilate's desire to remain in power. The Jews claimed that no friend of Caesar would release a man like Jesus who claimed to be king. They brought Pilate right to a decision point. There was no backing away. He had to fish or cut bait. Look at John 19, verses 16b through 18. Here we see that Pilate caved in to the demands of the Jewish leaders and handed Jesus, whom again he thought was innocent, over to be crucified. Verse 16b says, Then they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went out to what is called the place of the skull, or which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate gave in. He caved to his own fear and the pressures. He gave Jesus over to those who clamored for his crucifixion, probably on a charge of treason. They, you know, used uh, Caesar's name, and any king, anybody who uh, claimed to be king, uh, their uh, logic was that they were a potential threat to Caesar. And you did not want to be viewed that way. And Pilate gave Jesus over. The they, and they took him away, are the Roman soldiers. They took Jesus away and prepared, air quotes, prepared him 
for crucifixion. Now, I mentioned earlier what Jesus had already been through up to that point. He'd been beaten. Uh, Pilate had had him beaten uh, during the time that he was uh, being interrogated and questioned by Pilate. Execution types. The Jews... Preferred method of execution, if you will, was stone people. Remember Stephen, he was placed down into a, a pit or a hole, if you will, and people uh, lined the perimeter of that pit, and then they took stones and literally threw them at him and pelted him to death. The Romans, however, preferred crucifixion. And they had the sole authority to execute. So they got to make the call. Other gospel accounts in Matthew and Mark state that Jesus was whipped, beaten, and scourged more so as to weaken him and hasten death as part of preparing him for crucifixion. Again, they wanted to go through the crucifixion process. They didn't want the prisoner to die being scourged. I'm sure some probably did, you know, uh, in other cases. But they wanted to beat and weaken them so that when they were uh, being crucified, uh, they didn't take as long to die. Mentioned crucifixion earlier, and let's talk a little more specifically about that now. It was the most horrible form of execution in its day. And it could last up to 24 hours. It was intense and excruciating physical pain on top of what Jesus had already experienced. But there was also public humiliation. Everything was done publicly. It was not to make light of it, it was in many ways sport for people to watch this. If you go back to, to Rome and, and read and, and look, you know, see uh, movies uh, about that time period, they had uh, prisoners that they'd throw into uh, the lion's den and have them, you know, uh, fight the lions, if you will, and the lions would always win. Or you had gladiators that would fight one another to the death, and it was for public sport. Well, this execution had a public aspect to it, and it was to publicly humiliate. It was conducted in public places for onlookers. The victim was stripped almost naked. There was verbal taunting and mocking and, and, and cursing and, and calling names. Uh, directed toward the people who were being crucified. And if that were not enough, in many cases after the victim died, the bodies were left hanging on the cross for wild animals and birds of prey and other uh, uh, varmints to take care of the bodies. So you can see just how awful crucifixion was. For a Jew, there was an, another aspect to being crucified. Uh, the suffering carried an additional stigma, that is, a mark of disgrace or a stain. Old Testament law included a curse for the Jew who was executed on a tree. They were removed from the covenant family. You can read about that in Deuteronomy 21. The key point here is, as mentioned earlier, Jesus experienced physical, emotional, and spiritual pain associated with going to the cross and being crucified for your and my sin. This was God's price, a very steep price for the payment of our sin debt. And Jesus willingly paid it. Jesus was sinless, but he picked up your and my tab. Let's talk about the elements of crucifixion. The prisoner, he carried um, 
the cross piece to the crucifixion site or the execution site, being humiliated all along the way. And this was after being beaten, flogged, and scourged. And I described that earlier. But Jesus revealed that he was an overcomer, not a victim. For him, the cross was not a tool of death, but a doorway to eternal life and glory. At the execution site, in this case, uh, it was a hill outside Jerusalem called Golgotha in Aramaic, which also known as the place of the skull in Hebrew. But the more contemporary name that we refer to it as is Calvary from the Latin translation of the Greek word for skull. The soldiers laid the cross down. flat on the ground, and fasten the criminal or the prisoner to that cross. Sometimes they used ropes. Many times they used nails or spikes, which was definitely the case with our Lord and Savior Jesus. These weren't small nails. These were seven-inch nails or spikes. And they didn't nail them through the hand. You know, oftentimes we see pictures, artist renditions, and we see the wounds in the hands here. That would not have supported the weight of a, of a man. No, they drove the spikes and the nails through the wrist, through the tendons and the ligaments to the cross, through the wrists, and through the feet, around the ankle area, to support the body weight so that the victim could stay on the cross longer for more sport, more suffering, more pain. Then the soldiers raised the cross with the prisoner attached upright and dropped it in a one or two foot hole. Not gently dropped, but with a thud. Imagine the tearing and the pain the victim incurred as that happened. Many pictures show Jesus, uh, you know, on a cross, you know, 10 feet in the air. That was not the way crucifixions were done. Usually, the cross was only two to three feet in the air. But it was enough to cause tremendous pain and it gave easy access to those who would mock and throw slurs and curses toward our Lord and Savior. What did Jesus experience? What does a victim experience when they're crucified? Well, physically, there was severe inflammation Swelling of the wounds caused by the nails, torn tendons, internal bleeding, throbbing headaches, sunburn, a burning thirst, inability to breathe without rising or pushing up off of the vertical support, an accumulation of fluid in the lungs, Incredible pain from the strained position and intense cramping. What about emotionally? I mentioned that earlier. There's another aspect of crucifixion. His most treasured and valued part of creation that was created in his image for relationship and fellowship was rejecting and rebelling against him and sought to kill and destroy him. Jesus' heart was literally broken because of what was being done to him. Spiritually, Jesus, who had knew no sin and had a perfect relationship and fellowship with God the Father, was separated from God for the first time because 
Jesus was bearing your and my sin and the sin of all mankind for all ages. Crucifixion was horrible. But with all of that, death usually came from lack of food and water and ultimately asphyxiation. Not being able, not having the strength to rise up off the vertical support and your lungs filling up with fluid and you drowning on your own fluid. Verse 18 says, they crucified him in the middle. I've never been shot. But unlike being shot or hanged or stabbed to death, where death can be instantaneous, crucifixion was a long, painful process by design. It was designed to prolong suffering and humiliation by the victim for the enjoyment and entertainment of those that were watching. It was sadistic. Jesus was crucified between two violent revolutionaries and thieves. He was numbered as a thief and counted and treated as a violator of the law, a sinner, although he was not. He was taking our place, yours and mine, with that punishment. And this was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy uh, from Isaiah 53, 12, where the prophet wrote, the Messiah would be numbered among sinners on behalf of sinners. The key item for all of us to understand is, what was the purpose for Jesus' suffering? Well, that purpose was forgiveness. And forgiveness required a blood sacrifice. Hebrews 9.22. Why? Well, as sinners in rebellion, and that word rebellion means resistance, defiance of any authority, control, or tradition. But as sinners in rebellion against God, we deserve death. Death and eternity in hell separated from God. But Jesus' death paid in full the required price we could never pay on our own. Jesus' death and only his death satisfied God's steep price and righteous demands and opened the door for our salvation if we will accept it. That's our part. In the last section, John 19, 28 through 30, Jesus' final suffering and death. Let's read uh, this final scripture together in John 19, 28 through 30. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Verse 28, Jesus' actions and his words on the cross continued to fulfill many of the Old Testament prophecies. God had given Jesus a mission. to go and to be that perfect sacrifice to satisfy the sin debt so that his crowning jewel of creation could be reconciled back to him. God missed us because he loved us so. Some of those prophecies included the soldiers gambling or casting lots for his clothing. You can see that in Psalms 22, 18. But also in the midst of that crucifixion, we see, we see Jesus making arrangements for, for the long-term care and well-being 
of his earthly mother, Mary. He was, he was completing God's mission and he was making uh, long-term uh, plans and preparation for the eternal salvation of all mankind. But even there in the midst of all that suffering with his mother uh, at the foot of the cross witnessing this, he made arrangements for her care when he told John the disciple that he should take care of Mary. And John accepted that. Remember that Mary most likely was a widow by now. And in that society, in that time, widows, unless they had an advocate, were pretty much left as prey for the religious leaders and the, those in the political authority. Jesus knew that. He took, he took care of his mother. C compare and contrast uh, John's compassion that was demonstrated by his willing adoption of Mary versus the heartless and st sadistic attitude and actions of the Roman soldiers toward Jesus and his followers. This time, Jesus saw the finish line. He was right there. He knew that everything was finished now. Jesus had completed the assignment the Father had given him. His work and mission on earth was done. And at that time, he allowed himself in his humanness a moment of relief when he cried out, I'm thirsty, which also fulfilled prophecy. Think about Jesus right there for a moment. He had gone without food and water since the Passover meal the night before. He was sleep deprived. He had lost a lot of blood from the beatings, floggings, and the crucifixion process itself. And the body needs fluid to replenish blood, which is the life, which is the life within our veins. Jesus would have experienced extreme thirst. He was calling attention to the fulfillment of Scripture in Psalms 22 and 69, which talk about a suffering servant, accused, insulted, humiliated, and in need of rescue. Psalms 22.15 says, My strength is dried up like baked clay. I'm from North Georgia where red clay abounds. And when you've gone for a long period of time without any water, the clay gets so dry and so hard that it breaks up into small pieces and kind of rolls and curls up. But it... It's almost as hard as a brick. He says in that verse, My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Have you ever been that thirsty? In Psalm 69, 21, Instead, they gave me gall. That is something bitter, very bitter, for my food. And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Though not yet dead and not buried and certainly not resurrected, Jesus understood that everything necessary for mankind's atonement had been accomplished. He had done it. The sin debt created by humans had been paid by Jesus, who was God in human flesh. I keep coming back to this, but God provided payment for his beloved creation. He didn't want us to be separated from him. In verse 29, Jesus, the Son of God, became a man, flesh and blood, at his birth. And while he did become man, he did not surrender his deity at any point. Jesus' thirst and ultimately his death indicated that he was completely human, just like you and me. When they nailed those spikes in his wrist, it hurt. 
excruciatingly hurt, just like it would you and me, because he was a human being. They used a hyssop branch. And it's probably not the uh, the uh, the weed or or the vegetation that that comes to mind that was uh, in that area. Maybe it was a spear or javelin that had been made out of out of that, and they put a sponge on the end of it, and they they dipped that sponge into a a vessel of sour wine that was close by, and they lifted it up to his lips and let him take some of that. I'm sure he would have preferred water, but at that time, uh, anything was better than what he had. They provided a small amount of relief short term, but really uh, it their purpose was to perhaps prolong death. So more pain and more suffering could be experienced by Jesus. This was an apparent act of mercy by the Romans, but it was actually a form of torture if indeed it was to prolong his life and suffering. In verse 30, Jesus said, It is finished. It is finished. Jesus confounded and foiled the Romans plan by bowing his head and giving up his spirit, dying, after declaring it is finished. What about that phrase, it is finished? One, Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecy concerning, concerning the Messiah and the suffering servant. Jesus completed his father's assignment. The apostle John started his gospel by referring to John the Baptist proclamation of the Lamb of God. Now he's bookending it by describing the Lamb's sacrifice. Jesus understood that everything necessary was paid in full. And it did pay in full, the sin debt. It had been accomplished in his life and even in his death. Jesus left nothing undone. Jesus intended it as a shout of triumph, not a final sigh of relief. It is finished. Compare that, if you will, to winning a competition of anything, sports, uh, baking, uh, writing, or completing a big assignment. You know, it is finished. Jesus had completed the Father's mission by living a sinless life while announcing the arrival of God's kingdom. Jesus' death served as a sacrifice for humanity's sins, making salvation, that is, rescue and restoration to God the Father possible for all who believe. And don't miss this important point. The Romans and the Jewish leaders used crucifixion in their mind to kill Jesus, to eliminate him. But right there in Scripture, it said that Jesus, after saying and declaring that it was finished, that the mission was done, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Jesus decided when it was time to die. The Romans executed the crucifixion process on Jesus, but they did not determine when Jesus died. No one took Jesus' life. He laid it down voluntarily. He, uh, he demonstrated complete authority and sovereignty over all things when he delivered his life and spirit to God the Father. Everything happened exactly according to God's timing and plan. Good Friday. That comes in six days. It's the darkest hour in human history. Why? Because Jesus died. 
But God turned this tragedy into the best possible news. Jesus died in your and my place. He paid the price for our sins. He saved us through his death on the cross of Calvary because only he could do that. This coming Friday is Good Friday, and it represents the day Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and the Son of God was crucified on the cross and died for the sin of humanity. Crucifixion was a gruesome and torturous physical death designed to completely humiliate publicly and destroy its victim. In Jesus' case, the physical savagery was accompanied by intense emotional pain and the heartache of spiritual separation from his heavenly Father. Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God who willingly became the blood sacrifice that God required to pay the debt for humankind's sin that separated us from our Heavenly Father. Forgiveness was needed, but mankind could not pay the cost. God loved His creation so much that He provided the only acceptable sacrifice, His Son Jesus. He did it for every human being that ever has lived, is living now, or will ever physically live. But more personally, He would have done the same thing for you or me had we been the only human being ever born. We celebrate the birth of Jesus at Christmas. We read about his life and ministry in the scriptures of the Bible. And at Easter, we joyously celebrate God's raising him from the grave, delivering him from death, commonly known as the resurrection. In order for Jesus to be resurrected, Jesus had to die. And he died a horrible death that helps us understand a little clearer what God thinks about sin. Jesus has done all there is to do for humankind's salvation and restoration to our Heavenly Father. Forgiveness is only possible because Jesus died for our sin. When Friday comes this week, pause and think of Jesus, our Savior, giving His all for us. That is, that is God's love for you and me as we look forward to next week and Resurrection Sunday. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for the time this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus. Thank you, Father, that He willingly paid such an incredibly high price, Father, for our sin, a debt that we could never pay. Lord, you love us that much. Give us a better, deeper understanding of that, Father. And help us, Lord, to live our lives with that in view, Father. And help us to share with others who have not heard but need to hear the good news of the one who gave his all and paid it all for us at Calvary. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.